It is good be, to be with you this morning, as I mentioned in the prayers. Um, I had recorded this, and I wasn't sure, you know, with things that happen with surgery, with things that happen with flights these days. I wasn't arriving home. I, I walked into my house last night at 9.46 uh, p.m., and so I was afraid that something might happen, and so when I offered to have either Anne preach the sermon, I said, I'll write it. Um, maybe we just give it to somebody else if I can't be here, or, or Jeannie. And Jeannie said, well, you know, we could always record it. And I'm like, well, yeah, we could. And so uh, on the last minute, we, we have this recorded in case anyone wants a copy. Um, you know, uh, I had not actually planned to go out to Las Vegas, even though this mother's heart wanted to go. Do you know what I'm saying? Uh, but my, my son struggles with anxiety. And making the plans, trying to be a host to me, uh, while he was trying to get ready for surgery, I could tell it was overwhelming him. And so I said, I will not go. And I then, um, the, his partner who was going to take him to the hospital got a fever and was not going to be able to take him to the hospital. He had a fever Saturday and he had a fever Sunday and he had a fever Monday. And my son calls and says, Mom, I'm going to have to delay the surgery. And I said, no, you're not. I'm coming. And so I did, and I was able to make it there in time. I arrived on Tuesday, and I spent the whole day traveling, but I was able to get there. He is, suffers from Crohn's disease. I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with that, but that's a gastrointestinal disorder, and it causes your organs to attack themselves. It adheres sometimes to itself and to other organs, and through uh, years, he's been battling this since he was nine years old. And so from a lifetime, he's 32 now, and from a lifetime of battling that, he, there was one section that was a severely diseased section of his colon where the scar tissue was so great, uh, he experienced very severe pain uh, when any food tried to pass through. He was at great risk for rupture, and so the surgeon and his doctor um, said that he needed to have that out, otherwise, he risked a perforation. And if you've ever known anybody who's had a perforated colon, that is a very, very difficult, uh, your life hangs in the balance. It's happened to my sister, who also has Crohn's, three times, and three times we thought we would lose her. So, of course, we thought the surgery was going to be the answer. And he is doing very well. The, um, the doctor was able to attach healthy to healthy, um, so all of the disease portion is out. That's not saying the disease will not strike elsewhere in his colon. That is uh, entirely likely. But um, for, for a time, he may experience a pain-free life, uh, which is something that he has not experienced since he was nine years old. And so I, I pray for complete healing for him, and I know you join me in that. Our children are precious. Amen. Um, you know, and then when I, I wasn't sure I would ever be a grandma, I'm so delighted that I'll join that as it's been called exclusive club. Uh, but whether we have children of our own or not, these children right here are ours to raise. These children in our church, when they are baptized, we take a vow. We take a vow to raise them to know and to love Jesus. So every single one of us is a grandparent of sorts to each of you. And we love you so much. And, and I know often they're helping in the nursery or doing other things during worship, and we don't often get to see them in worship. But seeing your bright, smiling faces here today um, makes this mama's heart happy because um, you're my grandkids, or my kids, actually. You probably could be my kids. But uh, anyway, it's so good to have them. But even Ann Jones and TJ... They are the ones that week in, week out, spend time with these youngsters so that they'll know and love Jesus. Uh, last night, they had a great party at um, Wayne, actually, and Jesse hosted them. They went swimming in 82-degree uh, water. How many of you actually swam? Good for you. Look at them. Who would do that? I wouldn't do that. And, and it was 68 degrees, I think, Jesse said, outside. Is that what it was? <laughs> But, you know, we have families that love and care for them. I know many families have hosted these children at their homes on Sunday nights. And for that, I am so very grateful. 
Um, it takes all of us to raise them to know and love. And your presence here today speaks of your love and your care and your concern. But for every leader who does that, there are the parents. Uh, so I want to applaud the parents who bring their kids to church on Sunday. Amen? I know when I was growing up, there was no question where I'd be on Sunday morning. Today, it's not quite the same. Being in church on a Sunday morning is a choice. And I'm thankful to the parents who make that choice. And I'm thankful to the youth that make that choice to be here on a Sunday morning. Our scripture today is a perfect passage for a Sunday like this. Um, our Hebrew word to live by is Shema, which means hear or listen. How many of us wish our children would listen to us? How many of us wish they would hear us, truly hear us, right? They may listen, but I'm not sure they really hear us. How many of us wish there were people in general would listen to us? Um, we have that problem, right? But I've always heard it said we have two ears and one mouth for a reason, right? Uh, we need to listen far more than we talk. But God wants us to listen, wants us to truly hear his word. As Graham said in his children's sermon, which the youth, by the way, all came up with that. I didn't tell them what to say in the children's sermon. Uh, they came up with that as a group, and he was so brave to deliver that without a script. And we're building. It's building blocks, right? And what happens, as he said, if you st start on step four, it's not going to work out right, right? You need to start at the beginning. Start with step one. And God's word is the beginning. Uh, we have already heard once from our passage, Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9, but I want to pray over it and read it one more time because the Lord really wants us to hear this passage. So we need to hear it. We're going to hear it more than twice, actually. I'm going to repeat it again later. We just can't hear it enough. Uh, so let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be acceptable to you, my rock and my redeemer. I pray, Lord, that you would give us ears to hear and a heart to respond to your words spoken into our lives today. Amen. So let's hear again Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children and talk about them when you're at home and when you're away, when you lie down and when you rise. Bind them as a sign on your hand. Fix them as an emblem on your forehead and write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. Once again, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This particular passage known as the Shema is our Hebrew word to live by. Um, this is what it looks like, Shema, hear, or listen. And the word appears in Scripture 550 times between Genesis and Revelation. Obviously in the Old Testament it's in Hebrew and the New Testament it's in Greek. But this particular passage in Deuteronomy is something that faithful Jews still recite every morning and every night. This is a prayer that they read every morning and every night. This is a prayer that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ read every morning and every night. You get the idea that it's kind of important. These words are designed to focus us in on what matters most. What matters most in our lives? How many times do we wake up in the morning in a fog? Do you guys hop up and just uh, get out of bed and just say, I'm ready to go to school today? Is that the way the day starts for you? No? <laughs> 
many of you get up and say, I'm ready to get with the day? I, I know a lot of us wake up in a fog. Now, I don't drink coffee. I don't drink caffeine. And I'm blessed with a clarity of mind when I open my eyes in the morning. That's a gift that God has given me. Uh, but Kim was the opposite. He would actually wake up every morning. He would stumble, and I'm not kidding you. I was concerned when our bedroom was on the second floor and he was going to have to make it to the coffee pot by going down some stairs. I thought, this is dangerous, but he would stumble to the coffee in the morning and he would have to sit on the sofa for an hour. I see some nods of approval. You, you understand what that's like? He would have to sit on the sofa for an hour before I, even, I knew not to talk to him until he'd had his coffee and his hour to wake up. Can I get an amen? Is anybody else like that? I know, right? I expect most people are like him. It takes a, a minute to wake up to kind of greet the day with the kind of enthusiasm that you want to have and gain focus. I will confess that these days I wake up in a fog and I'm a little disoriented as the reality of my life sets in. But however we wake up in the morning, there are moments in all of our lives when the stress of homework or exams or work the weight of unanswered emails or text, sickness, tiredness, even financial pressures can steal our focus away from what matters most. What our passage today teaches us is that this struggle to focus is not new. This is something that people in all ages and places have struggled with. It is not new. The pressures may be different, but they've always been there, and they'll always be here from generation to generation. The Shema is a prayer spoken when we wake up to center us on God. It draws our focus away from the world and everything that would distract us to the one thing that matters most. Shema, hear and listen. These words all imply action. To be an active listener means to participate in the conversation. We're not sitting there waiting to think, well, what am I going to say in response to what you're saying to me? We listen with no response planned. We simply listen and allow ourselves to be guided by what God speaks into our lives. It requires us to be totally engaged to tune our senses to what we're hearing and ask ourselves, once they've finished speaking, how do I respond to that? How would God have me respond to that? And there is a difference between having ears and hearing. Jesus gives us a beautiful example in Mark's Gospel, and I want to read now from Mark 4, 1 through 9 is the parable of the sower. Again, he began to teach beside the sea. Such a very large crowd gathered around him that he got into a boat on the sea and sat there. While the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land, he began to teach them many things in parables, and in his teaching he said to them, listen, a sower went out to sow, and he sowed some seed, fell on the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Other seed fell on rocky ground where it did not have much soil, and it sprang up quickly since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. Other seed fell into good soil and brought forth grain, growing up and increasing and yielding, thirty and sixty and a hundredfold. And he said, let anyone with ears to hear listen. A beautiful example of the difference between hearing and understanding. Some hear and they do not understand. Some hear and think they understand. Then others hear and truly understand. 
Mark 4, 20 shows us what happens when we hear and we truly understand. He says, and these are the ones sown on the good soil. They hear the word and accept it and bear fruit. 30 and 60 and 100 fold. When we hear and truly understand the word of God, we will bear fruit, fruit that will last. This morning, our youth are leading us in our liturgy, leading our children, leading our prayers. And it warms my heart to have you here. This is what we want to pass on to our children. I'm thankful for children and youth leaders through the years and parents who commit to bring their children to church, who talk about God. What an incredible gift to give the next generation. Over the past few weeks, the news has been filled with reports of the Queen of England's funeral. Now, I must confess, if this is a sin, I confess it. I have a bit of a fascination with the royals, okay? Am I the only one? I'm a little bit fascinated with them. I've even started watching that series, The Crown, on Netflix. And, oh my gosh, it's so good. Um, I watch quite a bit of the coverage. Have y'all seen that series, The Crown, on Netflix? We'll have to have a party. Uh, deals with some really good life lessons. I think we could learn a lot watching that. I like that idea. The crown at the parsonage. Yeah, there you go. Uh, but I watched quite a bit of the coverage of the funeral this week, and through the reports, I was really taken. I hadn't really understood the queen's role in the monarchy and, and life in general, and I was, I was taken with Queen Elizabeth's commitment to love and serve God. That was real for her. She took that very seriously. And to love and serve the people. She was hailed as a peacemaker, not taking sides with one political party or another, but keeping the focus on what was best for her beloved country. This is what God's asking of us, to remember who and whose we are. We're children of the Most High God. That's who we are. That is our identity. We've been given the incredible gift of salvation. Now God calls us to remember that gift, to share that gift. I wonder what our days would look like if we prayed the Shema morning and night. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. So, church, do we? Do we? Do we love the Lord our God with all of our heart and all of our soul and all of our might? This is what the Lord wants us to hear and truly understand. Love the Lord your God with all our hearts. Jesus said the, the very same thing when he was asked what is the greatest commandment. Do you remember what he said? He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. And the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. This is consistent throughout Scripture. This is what God wants us to hear. Back to Deuteronomy, picking up with verse 6. Keep these words I'm commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children. Talk about them when you're at home and when you're away, when you lie down and when you rise. So, church, do we? Do we? Do we keep the Lord's words in our hearts? Do we talk about them when we're at home and when we're away, when we rise up and when we go to bed? Are we... Are we reciting God's word? Do we recite them to the children in this church? You know, I see Jennifer go out with the children every Sunday, and we say, well, that's her job. Well, what if we gave her one Sunday a month where she didn't have to go back, and she could worship in here with her husband, Derek? What if we had volunteers who would step up to recite these words 
to our children so that Jennifer could be out here? What if we had volunteers, and we already do, who step up and help Ann and TJ, hosting them at their home? Do we talk about the Lord and what he's taught us when we're home, when we're away, when we lie down and when we rise up? The Shema. This is what the Lord wants us to hear and truly understand. May it be so in our lives today. Amen.